My name is Rick Astley and this video is about changing the fog lights on the Jaguar XK8 to LEDs so that they may be operated as daytime running lamps. I own a 2004 car and I believe this is good from 99 to 2005 but I'm not absolutely certain about those cars prior to 2001 where the fog light design was slightly different. This is a follow-on from a video I did previously called Modifying Lighting on the Jaguar XK8. I have a reprise on the end of this of how to change the fog lights to DRLs very easily and I've modified that a little at the request of some people who had some alternative ways they wanted it done and for those people who have HIDs in the position of the low beams. And so there is some overlap and some modification too. These are the subjects I'll cover and when I'm done I'll put some times down the side so you can skip back and forth should you not want to listen to everything. I'll talk about why we want to use LEDs at all. Perhaps there are some filament lamps around that will work for you. Why the Jaguar XK8 presents some particular problems in changing to LEDs the solutions I've tried, some less than successful attempts, and I hope to stop you from making the same mistakes as I did in this regard. The successful solutions I've done so far and the question about will they be reliable, some things I've done to try to improve the reliability, and a recap from a previous video about how to make the XK8 fog lamps operate as daytime running lamps and I've added a little bit to that for those people who have HID lamps in the low beams and for those others who do not want the LED fog lamps to switch off when the low beams are selected. And a note here, it turns out that it's illegal in New South Wales, Australia to use fog lamps as daytime running lamps. I've no idea why but it seems that's the fact. Before trying to use LEDs in this application I first tried using this Philips Crystal Vision Ultra bulb which is supposedly brighter and whiter than the standard bulb but I didn't really find it quite as bright and quite as white as I wanted which is why I went to the LEDs. This shows the rear of the packaging for that Philips bulb and you can see in this picture here that I've added a couple of notes. They show that the lifetime is about 150 hours and if you do say mixed highway and surface street driving and average about 50 miles per hour that would give you about seven and a half thousand miles of driving. The 150 hours predicted operation of this high brightness, high whiteness Phillips bulb is pretty poor compared with the lifetime of a standard bulb which is 400 hours and again at the same speed of 50 miles an hour that would take you 20,000 miles compared with only seven and a half for this brighter bulb. The reason that I make such a big deal of the life of these bulbs is that when used as daytime running lamps they run for 100% of the time that the vehicle runs and of course they were really designed as headlamp bulbs when they run for a much smaller proportion of the running time of the vehicle. But when run for 100% of the time, the number of miles these things get under them before they fail is of course much less. The datum point for voltage generally in the lighting industry in a vehicle is considered to be 13.5 volts. And in this graph we show that at 13.5 volts we call that 100% brightness. And in order to extend the life of filament bulbs used as daytime running lamps, they generally run at a lower voltage. But that does affect the brightness. Here we can see that if we reduce the voltage by 5% to about 12.8 volts, the brightness goes down by 20% to 80%. And in the event that we drop the voltage a further 5% to 90% of 13.5, about 12.2 volts, the brightness goes down by a whole third, about 66% of the brightness at 13.5 volts. 
If we're prepared to sacrifice some brightness, however, we get a much, much greater benefit in life. If again we say that the voltage of 13.5 volt provides 100% life, then reducing that by 5% gives us a big gain to 185% of life, and a 10% reduction on that 13.5 volts gives us a 355% increase in the life of the bulb. Filament lamps like this one are only about 5% efficient, which means that 95% of the power is used producing heat. And this bulb lasts less long than the standard bulb. It's run at an even higher temperature than the standard bulb. That gives it a whiter light. They also put a blue coating on the outside to retain some of the yellow light inside the bulb. And along with that it retains a lot of the heat as well so it gets very hot indeed and has a shorter life it is said to be much whiter but whereas the standard bulb has a color temperature of about 3100 k which is generally called soft white the color temperature of the crystal ultra bulb is around 3600 k and that's called bright or cool white what i've done here is shown the color temperature of 6000 K and where it would fall on this card if it could fit on the card and it can't it's off the card but 6000 K is daylight and that's the color temperature of the LED bulbs we would expect to use in replacement of this filament lamp. Turning now to replacing the standard bulb with an LED there are some limitations here to the bulb that we replace the standard bulb with and they're shown in this picture of the back of the fog light and the arrows here show the problem areas first of all the red arrow points to a slot and that's because the H1 bulb is very narrow and will fit through that slot so any bulb that replaces it also has to fit through that slot before taking this picture I placed a bright light right in front of the fog light and apart from down in the right hand corner because I'm not dead straight on that light isn't getting through the front and that's because there's a cap over the front of the bulb and that limits the length of the bulb that could replace it and the yellow arrows point to three slots which take some tabs on the retaining mechanism for the bulb and we've got to be able to accommodate that or those slots when we replace the standard bulb with an LED. Here's a picture of the front of the headlight and again you can see the red arrow pointing to that slot through which the bulb passes and the cap which limits the overall length of any replacement. This picture looks like a cop show lineup of the usual suspects. On the left is the original bulb and you can see that it gets very hot in that black area. The lamp labeled number one is obviously far too long. That number three is both too long and too wide. And so I thought that number two would be the Goldilocks one that wasn't too hot and was the right length and the right width. However, that Goldilocks bulb when put into the car turned out to be extremely disappointed. Here you can see the standard bulb on your left and the LED on your right and it's pretty pathetic in terms of its brightness isn't it? So we need to find something else that's going to work in this application and we're going to have a look first of all at the bulb holder that the standard H10 goes into and decide how we're going to find something that will work in place of that. Here's that same standard XK8 fog lamp socket lined up against the outlines for the 9006 or HB4 flange and the 9005 HB3 flange for standard bulbs that are used in automotive applications. Again turning to the back of the fog light we can see where we have to fit that flange and first of all I've superimposed the outline of a 9006 and there's some overlap. The tabs overlap the little sockets that they go into and this one is obviously unsuitable. 
but the 9005 looks about right and so that's the one I pursued when looking for an LED to replace the standard H1 bulb. Although the flange looks like a 9005 or HB3 headlamp bulb flange, any LED 9005 HB3 equivalent is going to look pretty much dimensionally like the filament bulb. And here I'm comparing the XK8 H1 fog lamp with the bulb holder and bulb put together with a 9005 or HB3 headlamp and there's a number of problems. It's wider, it's longer, it's got a smaller o-ring and it's got uh, different connectors, some of which are easy to deal with and some which are much harder. The connectors are one of the easiest problems to deal with and here I purchased some connectors which will fit into the harness from the car where it would fit into the back of the fog lamp. Unfortunately you have to buy more than you need and you don't need one half of them, you only need the male half of this connector. As for the connector that would fit into the back of a 9005 lamp holder, I chose this one, there's lots around, but I chose this one. It's intended for a Jeep and I just cut off the connector I didn't want. Obviously at some point then the connector I showed in the previous picture which was for fitting into the Jaguar harness and this one that is for fitting into a 9005 bulb have to be joined together and we'll get into that later. This was the first 9005 bulb I bought and you can see where I put the white arrow. It's too wide there to go through the slot so I tried using a Dremel to cut it down. I damaged the bulb and I wonder too whether if I'd removed all that metal on both sides the bulb would have gotten too hot, whether that metal indeed was intended for heat sinking the bulb and optimally and I would uh, ruin that effect. Next I tried this fan cooled H1 LED and I swiped the flange from the bulb I showed you previously which was a 9005 and put it on this lamp and I had to pack it up a little bit the uh, diameter is different so I used some tape underneath over the ferrule and then put the flange over that this is air cooled and it actually worked for about I guess 50 hours but then this happened and so I had to go back and look at other alternatives to this fan cooled LED bulb just to check that it was the fan that was the problem I took the whole thing apart and put it on a bench and powered it up and as you see initially the fan is stalled and until I hit it with a tool it doesn't start immediately and indeed it starts a little slow and then speeds up so I decided that this device obviously needed a fan and if that fan fails then the lamp is going to fail with it and so I decided to look for a fanless LED one that was designed to work without a fan yet still dissipate all the heat generated by the lamp. Both lamps I'd bought prior by the way came from eBay and it's there that I looked for a fanless LED and this is the one I bought which is an H1, it has an H1 flange. I pulled that off and once again I had to put some packing tape around it. This time I decided to use aluminum tape because it's more solid than any heat shrink tubing or PVC tape that I'd considered before and I thought it might add a little bit of mass that would dissipate some more heat and then I put an, a 9005 HB3 flange on that. The result of using this bulb after only about 10 hours of operation was again a one-eyed car and I admit this is the same picture I showed you before. I didn't take a picture of both failures, but it was the left-hand lamp, the one on our right, that went out on both occasions. And I'd agree that like the toss of a coin, it's just as likely that it was the left or the right that went the second time around. But I do believe it may be due to the right-hand lamp, the one on our left, getting rather more cooling than the one on the left-hand side of the car. The reason I believe that the lamp on the right side of the car may be operating with a little more cooling is that the snorkel from the car's air intake is 
on that side of the car and the wheel arch liner is removed here but there's plenty of gaps around the outside of this and one actually between the headlight and the hood that allows air to get into this area and possibly mean that this light gets cooled a little more. That's not to say that it wouldn't eventually fail anyway but uh, it would mean that this one was operating generally a little cooler than the one on the left. At this point you may be wondering why the hell I don't go out and buy a quality lamp and the reason is I actually couldn't find one. This one here for example is too thick at the base but this one here from GTR Lighting looks extremely promising. It probably does still need some modifications and I'm not really willing to risk spending nearly $200 on something that may not work or that I have to modify slightly and invalidate the warranty on. I have contacted GTR Lighting to get more information about this bulb, especially dimensional information, but unfortunately they've not been very helpful. While still considering the lamp from GTR Lighting, I found the one shown here in the middle on eBay. And the keyword here and the search term there is mini LED headlight 9005 flange. And you can see here that it's compared with actually the one on the left is the one I tried first and the one on the right very much like the one I tried last. Although that one does look as if it's rather too thick all the way up. To work in this application. Checking out the dimensions it seems that this lamp should fit albeit with a few small modifications. That black flange needs a little bit of filing and I'll describe that in a moment. The o-ring needs changing or at least we need to add an o-ring that is big enough to affect the ceiling and to give a little tension to the installation so the lamp doesn't rattle around in there. We'll also need to add a harness that transitions between that that comes out of the vehicle and the connector that's on the back of the lamp. The first modification that has to be made to the flange is the removal of these three bumps by the tabs. They don't appear on the Jaguar bulb holder so their presence means that it will not fit. They're simple to remove with a fine flat file. On the right of this picture you'll see the standard fog lamp socket for the Jaguar XK8 and there are three ramps that help the bayonet mechanism lock itself in and they are missing from the flange of the LED lamp and I recommend you add them there. I, I doubt that it's absolutely necessary but it does considerably help inserting the bulb into the fog lamp. You'll remember that the original lamp on the right had a larger o-ring than the 9005 flange and so I decided to add a second o-ring in the gap between the flange and the red o-ring on the left on the 9005 lamp. The large o-ring on the original bulb was there for a purpose and I think it helps to provide some elastic force to the bayonet mechanism when you put the lamp in and it of course also provides sealing so that moisture doesn't get into the fog lamp and perhaps spoil the reflector. The o-ring I've used was called an R16. I got that from a kit that I bought a long time ago from Harbour Freight and it's the Storehouse brand but I note that a similar company to Harbour Freight exists in the UK called Machine Mart and they have exactly the same kit under the Clark brand. You may also, in your plumbing box, have some old row rings from a faucet that might well fit. And you could also consider USA or British Standard Spec number 284, which is of a similar size. A company called Cree is considered the foremost in the development of LEDs. And their website says that the main cause of LED failures is improper thermal management and also the reliability of any LED is a direct function of the junction temperature. That junction is the PN junction inside the LED that actually emits the light. So we have to look at ways of reducing the heat. One way is to lower the input power. That will reduce the light output, but lower input power will result in lower output power, and power and heat are pretty much synonymous. 
and we might improve the heat sinking. That's the way of getting the heat away from the LED. There's limits to what can be done to an existing lamp, but we can do perhaps just a little to add and perhaps make the difference between failure or not. This graph shows the applied voltage to the LED along the bottom x-axis and on the left the LED current in red that is pulled by the LED at those voltages and the resulting power on the right y-axis in blue that comes from the product of that voltage and current. The LED actually doesn't switch on until it gets to 8 volts and then the current rises very rapidly in the next few volts to a peak of something around 1.25, 1.3 amps and then it starts to tail off. So the current is tailing off but the voltage is still increasing and that really means that the power flattens out between about 11 volts and 14 volts there. The current and power rise is so steep that a reduction to only 10 volts from 13 and a half results in a reduction of power of nearly 50%, actually to 54% if we go down to 10 volts. And it turns out that you can do that putting in a 4.7 ohm resistor. That may sound a strange value, but it does happen to be a standard value in the resistance ranges but doesn't reducing the power consumption of the LED by nearly 50% result in an enormous decrease in brightness. I've measured the brightness of the lamp, a relative brightness in fact, between that at 13.5 volts and that at 10, and it does happen that reduction to 54% of the power only results in a reduction in brightness of 25%. The 4.7 ohm resistor should certainly increase the life of the LED bulb, but does it significantly reduce the brightness to a point which is unacceptable? And to check it for myself, I put a turn signal module into the fog light circuit such that it alternately put the 4.7 ohm resistor in and out of circuit, and you can see the result here. Here's a still from the previous video. On the left is the light without the resistor and on the right it has the resistor. And I think you'll agree it's hard to tell which is which and I did have to check myself in fact. You can see there's some more white in the center of the light on the one on the left which doesn't have the resistor but they're close enough for me to decide anyway that the 4.7 ohm resistor didn't make enough difference to the brightness to be important to me, but I do expect it to make such a big difference to the reliability of the lamp that I'm going to put it in my circuit of my car. This is the eBay listing for the resistor I actually bought. It's a 4.7 ohm as we discussed, and it has a dissipation capability of 5 watts, and that's usually at about 170 celsius i think so the dissipation in this application is about 2.6 watts so there's plenty of latitude at the temperatures this will see resulting in a reliability that should be very good and a fairly low operating temperature although of course it is dissipating 2.6 watts so it certainly will get the chill off it this shows the short harness between the connector that goes to the vehicle harness and the connector at the back of the lamp and I soldered the 4.7 ohm resistor into this wiring and added heat shrink just to cover the wires where they were bare after being soldered. You can see the complete harness here and also that I covered the resistor over with some heat shrink just to protect it, but uh, that's not absolutely necessary, I think. It's a kind of belt and suspenders over the insulation that's put over the solder connections. I truly don't know if it will make any real difference, but I decided to add a heat sink to the back of the lamps in order to give some extra thermal mass and to allow convection cooling. These are 20 millimeter square and are supposed to come with an adhesive thermally conductive pad but didn't and the seller when challenged didn't seem to know what they were selling so I gave up and adhered them using JB Weld. I heated it up till it was nearly like water so that when I put this down 
there was a very, very thin layer and that should have helped the thermal conduction. The tendency, and at least my tendency, is to cut wires and cables too long for fear of cutting them too short. And that's probably what I've done here. You can probably just see that white square. That's the heat sink at the back of the lamp. And then I covered the harness in split convolute tubing and tied it up to a bracket, which is a tie between the fender and the body of the vehicle. This next photograph shows the same thing on the right side of the vehicle. This next section is a reprise on how I made the fog lights into daytime running lamps. And since we don't use our fog lamps as such very often, the whole point really of this whole video is to use them as daytime running lamps. And so I'm going over how I did that. This video was made before I changed the lamps into LEDs and so there may be some reference to filament lamps in there and I've added a little bit at the end. A friend told me he didn't want his daytime running lamps to go out when he switched his low beams on and so I wired it slightly differently for him and this would also work for those people who have HID HID lamps for the low beams. Uh, nobody uses hids for high beams because they take too long to warm up. So instead of grounding the circuit and giving a return through the low beam lamps, I do it through the high beam lamps, which really makes no difference to their operation because the body processor does not allow the fog lights to come on anyway when the high beams are switched on. Lastly, I'm going to turn to the front fog lights. I believe in the safety benefits of daytime running lights, especially in a car like the XK8, which has a low frontal area. I chose to use the fog lights partly because it seems that's what Jaguar has done for territories to which the car was shipped, where daytime running lights are mandatory, like Canada. And it appears that in the body processor, there is a link to the cranking input so that when you start the car, the daytime running lights come on. And if you have a friendly Jaguar dealer, they may be able to reprogram that body processor in order that the fog lamps come on as daytime running lamps. But I don't know if that is really the case. Rather than pay a Jag dealership to reprogram your vehicle, you'll find my method much less expensive. It's also very easy, but does need some care. What the method I use achieves is it switches on the front fog lamps with ignition, effectively making them into daytime running lamps or DRLs. On the basis that the DRLs are B seen rather than C with lamps, I have them switching off when the low, or as Jaguar call them, dip beams are on. And when full beam is selected, since on the XK8, the low beams still run when full beams are on, the DRLs will remain off. If you should need to use your fog lights as C with lamps when the low beams are operating, you can simply use the front fog lamp switch, which is on the dash, and that's just a normal operation. Also as normal, when you switch the front fogs on yourself, when a high beam is selected, the fog lamps will switch off. I should add that this method will not work if you have HID headlamps and may not work if you have LEDs. It rather depends on the brand you buy. Just a few words about the circuit. The point marked 60 and circled is connected to one end of the front fog relay. And that is always live when ignition is on. So the point two on that relay needs to be grounded in order for the relay to operate. And that's normally done by the body processor when it sees a certain condition which is when the fog light button is pressed on the dash and when it sees that the low beams are on. We can also force that relay to operate if we ground that point. And here we do that using a diode that grounds via the very low resistance of the low or dip beam bulbs, which are in parallel and when cold, are a fraction of an ohm and insignificant compared with the 90 odd ohms of the front fog relay. So as long as the low beams are off, that relay can operate. However, when the low beams are on, the cathode of the diode 
goes to system voltage and since there's system voltage now on both contact one of the relay and cathode of the diode there is now no differential voltage between them and no current can flow and so the front fog relay opens and the fog lights go off. The diode is very important. If it were not there and you used just a piece of wire, when the low beams come on they would put 12 volts directly onto the body processor input and current could flow into it and short out the switching circuit for the fog lamp within it. We're going to put this diode in the engine compartment fuse box and you can see where it's located here. The problem is that unfortunately in 2003 Jaguar swapped the position of the high and low beam relays so you're going to have to be careful to make sure that you connect the diode between the right relay and if you have a car that's perhaps on the cusp of this change and you're not too sure you can just put the low beams on pull the relay you believe is the low beam relay and if it doesn't switch them off then you've chosen a high beam relay and then you'll find that if you pull the high beam relay instead that should switch the low beams off. This picture is for 1996 through 2003 vehicles and it shows how the diode is connected between the dip or low beam relay and the front fog relay. You'll also see the heater pump relay, the main beam relay and a power wash relay and you may want to remove those in order to get better access when you Put this diode in and note very carefully where the ring on that diode is so that you don't get it the wrong way around. The diode here you can see going between terminal 85 of the front fog relay and 87 of the dip or low beam relay. This diagram is for vehicles made between 2003 and 2005 and you can see that the dip or low beam relay has moved position and my car is a 2004 so this is the type of installation I'll be demonstrating. If you have a car newer than this I'm afraid I have no information and so you may have to check yourself whether or not this will work for those cars. Just as I did when I modified the rear fog lamps to make them into additional stop lamps, I've taken the 1N5402 diode, cut its lead short and attached two small stranded wires. Uh, I can't remember whether these are 22 or 24, but I don't think you should use a greater gauge than 22. And I've attached them by soldering to the diode and then covered the joins with heat shrink. I happen to have black and red wire available and, ha and I happen to have red and black heat shrink available but I would recommend even if you don't have these colors at least for the wires you use different colors so that you don't inadvertently put the diode in the wrong way round. Cut the leads fairly long to start with and then estimate the length you need to go between the relays. It will be different if you have a car which is pre-2003 from a car that's post 2003 because the distance between the relays is, is longer in the earlier cars and then uh, once you've cut them to length you can strip the ends about a quarter inch to expose the stranded internal conductors. Here I've placed the diode so it has the cathode wire that's the end with the ring on going to terminal 87 of the low beam relay and its anode the one I put red wire on going to terminal 85 of the fog lamp relay and it's ready now for the relays to be inserted and to grab both the conductor and the insulation so they can't move and you'll have a secure and reliable connection. The relays are now reinserted they're all exactly the same so it doesn't matter which goes in which cavity and we're now ready to do a test. Having checked everything seems okay under the hood, I'm now going to test the system out. And the first thing I'm going to do is switch the ignition on. With the ignition on now you can see that the fog lights come on as daytime running lights. Now let's switch the side lights on. The side lights are a little whiter than the fog lights, that's because we changed them out to LEDs earlier in this video. And now let's turn to low beam low beam or dip beam as Jaguar call it and now you can see that the fog lights have gone off and we're going to go to high beam and with high beam the fog lights remain off and that is because 
the uh, low beams stay on as well on this car when the high beams are on and as long as the low beams are on the fog lights will go out. Now we can take the high beams off, we can go back to side lamps, we can switch the ignition off and the side lamps stay on but the fog lights go out and then we can go to the off position on the lighting switch. That all seems to work so now and only now can we test the situation where we have low beams on, ignition on again, low beams on, fog lights are out but now I'm driving in fog and I think I'd like to use my fog lights as fog lights and not as daytime running lights so let's press the button on the dash and sure enough these work fine too the fog lights come on only when I want them and I can switch them off with the button as well again switch the ignition off and everything goes out and the switch is off for the lighting too so that was the extract from my XK8 lighting modifications video where I described how to make sure that the fog lights turned on with ignition but that also described how to make sure that they turned off when the low beams were on and for those who don't want that to happen I'm grounding the diode in these next two diagrams through the high beam relay instead that would imply that that would make the fog lights turn off when the high beam relay was operating but in fact that's the case anyway because the body processor controller in the XK8 does not allow the fog lights to work when the high beam relay is working too. This diagram is for the 1996 to 2003 and this diagram is for cars from that date onward. The important diagrams here are linked to in the description below in the form of PDF files.